High demand has sent commodity prices skyrocketing recently, but it's looking like supply rather than demand is going to be the more important factor that's going to drive the prices of natural resources and the companies that produce them much higher over the next five years. There's a lot of commodities that almost irrespective of demand growth, if demand held steady, uh, there would be supply shortages uh, and supply shortages that are um, in the five year time frame impossible to address. Hello and welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another week of making sense of money and the markets. And this week, I'm super excited to welcome Rick Rule to the program. He's a highly experienced investor and speculator in the natural resources industries. He's structured, led, and participated in hundreds of privately placed debt and equity issuances for resource companies around the world. Um, he has just only retired from his role as president and CEO of Sprott U.S. Holdings. Rick, congrats on your new retired life, though it seems you might be more active than ever as a private investor. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me back. I've, uh, I've enjoyed your work for a very long time, and so I'm delighted to uh, appear on your show. And, and yes, in fact, retirement has been great. As we were discussing in the pre-production uh, sort of talk, I regard retirement as sort of the emancipation of Rick Rule. I'm still very active. I just don't do anything that gives me aggravation. I just do things that give me pleasure. It's been wonderful. Oh, well, that's great to hear. Well, so we're kicking this off as a, as a mutual admiration society. Um, and hopefully that emancipated Rick Rule is able to run wild in today's interview. So if there were things that you might not have been able to say before, uh, you got an entire blank check here to, uh, to say whatever you want, Rick. I look forward to it. All right. Well, let's start with the question that I, I do like to ask every viewer, uh, you know, without uh, potentially introducing any biases early on, just want to hear straight from you. What is your current assessment of today's economy and financial markets? I'm nervous. Uh, I'm nervous about a recovery that seems to me to be driven as much by artificial liquidity as it is increases in productivity or trade. Now, I need to say that that's been a curse of mine over 30 years. Uh, I joke that I have correctly identified 17 of the last three economic declines. <laughs> um, but I, I, I continue to believe that this economy need to, may need to work off the excesses that we enjoyed in the 2009 to 19 bull market, which I also believe was driven as much by artificially low interest rates and liquidity as anything else. And I'm surprised that we have been able to shake off the uh, effects globally uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I must say that the current economic strength that we're enjoying uh, both delights uh, and scares me. Uh, I would hate uh, my fears, however valid they may be to come true. Uh, with specific regards to the non-precious metals part of the natural resources sector, we're enjoying pricing uh, in commodities like nickel and copper and tin that I would have expected to occur in 2025. Uh, I would have expected the, that the economy would go lower before it went higher uh, and the scarcity, or at least the pricing indications of scarcity in things like iron ore and nickel and copper. Well, I'm a great beneficiary of them, uh, frankly surprised me. Uh, and so I must say I'm tempering my delight with a bit of fear. All right, temporary, uh, tempering your delight with a bit of fear. That's a really interesting way to put it. So. Um... You know, uh, Rick, I've known you for a long time, um, and you, you, you mentioned the, the bull run from 2009 to 2019, and that, that really was kind of a bull run in everything but commodities. Correct. Um, so, A, it's sort of nice to, to, you know, see you personally, but also see um, long, um, you know, depressed commodity fans finally kind of begin to have their moment in the sun. Um, so we are in this new commodity upcycle. Um, you know, I guess my curious, my, my question for you is, um, uh, well, you made the distinction between non-precious metals commodities when you talked about prices kind of being at what you would consider 2025 levels. Um, I, I didn't want to quit, maybe go this quickly into precious metals, but just since you mentioned it, um, can you talk about why you think precious metals may not have participated in the 
the strength of the uh, the spike that we've seen in those other uh, commodities, and then maybe we can get into what you see ahead for them. Absolutely. Uh, in my experience, precious metals move as a consequence. I, I mean, they move for many reasons, but the primary reason from my viewpoint is as a consequence of people's concern about the purchasing power of their savings in more conventional instruments, uh, in particular things like the US 10-year treasury. When confidence in society is high, uh, and there's nothing uh, as a salve for, consequent, for confidence like liquidity, the interest in precious metals uh, is low. Uh, declining interest rates, as long as they don't go negative in real terms, uh, aren't necessarily good for gold. But concern about the purchasing power, uh, about maintaining purchasing power is what really drives gold. What I see right now is the policy response to economic and political pressures being only good for gold. Uh, the policy response is, well, bad for society and bad for the country, uh, I think are really uniquely suited to gold, very much like in the 1970s. Let's look at them. Quantitative easing. If the four of us did it, it would be called counterfeiting. We would be put in prison. <laughs> we're destroying currency units by, we're destroying the efficacy of currency units by making more of them. If you're a politician, you're popular and get reelected. Debt and deficits, uh, on a so-called recourse basis or on balance sheet basis, we as a, as a society in the United States owe each other $28 trillion off balance sheet in terms of the net present value of entitlements. Old folks like me, mostly, uh, we owe or have promised each other uh, amounts in excess of $120 trillion. By the way, that number is from the Congressional Budget Office, not from a cranky old libertarian named Rick Rule. <laughs> so on the debt side, we've got, what, almost $150 trillion in recourse obligations, and we service that debt with a deficit of $3 trillion a year. That makes people rightly concerned about the purchasing power of their savings instruments. The most important, of course, is negative interest rates, and they're not a natural phenomenon. They're a political construct. The idea that you would forego purchasing power and pay the borrower to take your money. Uh, my friend Jim Grant calls that return-free risk. Uh, and obviously that makes people <laughs> concerned about the purchasing power of their dollar. So my suspicion is that we stay in a precious metals bull market until quantitative easing, debt and deficits, and negative real interest rates uh, are addressed, uh, which I suspect means that we stay in a primary bull market in precious metals for quite some time. Okay, good. And I was, I was going to ask you that because that's not something I would expect um, would arrive any day soon. Right? <laughs> um, the US, I mean, the US tenure is really perplexing to me. Uh, I was taught growing up that that's the world's benchmark security. What I think uh, is interesting about the US tenure treasury, it's the first time in my life, I'm 68 years of age, that my government has told me the truth. They absolutely promised to give me back less money in 10 years than I give them today. Uh, it's a promise they're going to keep, but it's a distressing promise. Well, it, it, it is. And we've talked a lot on this channel in past videos about what a really, you know, treacherous and I almost want to say sort of nefarious time this is to regular people who are looking to, uh, you know, build capital and, and prudently grow it, right? There's no, there's no reward for savings, Correct. right? Uh, so everybody is forced out on the risk curve and they're going into all sorts of ridiculous assets that, that you know, in a sane world, you know, people who are looking for a, a you know, a risk managed uh, return on their money uh, would never be in. And uh, it works great while prices are going up. But if there's a hiccup in the system, <laughs> you know, it puts people at risk of losing uh, a whole bunch of money they can't afford to, to lose. Uh, so, you know, we, we can we can dig into that if you want to. But but I do want to get back to just sort of the, the current macro situation for commodities, because you mentioned your age a couple of times. You're not ancient, but you've been in, in you know, the, the industry, the, the natural resources industry for a long time. Um, again, we're seeing sort of surprisingly high demand right now. And part of that's based on um, you know, supply chains trying to catch up. Uh, and of course, a lot of stimulus flooding into the system right now. Um, but in terms of just sort of how you see the outlook for the commodity complex uh, today, how does that compare to other previous eras you've seen? Like, is, is, th is this the most optimistic you've ever been? Does this seem a lot like, you know, previous decades uh, might have been? What, what is history telling you here? The most optimistic I've ever been uh, was 
1998, 1999, 2000. Uh, it was very clear that society had underinvested in raw materials for at least a decade. Uh, and at the same time, global wealth led by China was growing. So we had rapidly increasing demand in the face of uh, supply constraints that were due to underinvestment. Uh, it was an absolute no-brainer. Uh, this is a confusing time. Um, I see the commodity complex benefiting over the next five years from, uh, once again, a structural underinvestment in the productive capacity and natural resources. I see, as an example, the copper industry living off copper deposits that were discovered 40 years ago, permitted 30 years ago, put in production 20 years ago, wonderful big mines, Escondida, Chukicamata, Grasberg, being very long of tooth. So I see inescapable shortages uh, among a lot of industrial commodities at the same time, which is of course very bullish. At the same time, I see the demand side uh, exceeding what I had rationally expected to be able to enjoy at this period of time. Commodity investors need to know that these are capital intensive cyclical businesses and bear markets are the authors of bull markets. Uh, when you underinvest, when commodity prices are low, you stimulate demand because things are cheap and you constrain supply because you're not making sustaining capital investments. And when you stimulate demand and you decrease supply, a wonderful thing happens to price right when you least expect it. But bull markets are also the authors of bear markets. Periods of high commodity prices uh, encourage consumers to substitute or, or conserve at the same time that producers are urged to overproduce. So people who don't understand that they are needing to be contrarian are gonna be a victim. We're in a circumstance now where we're enjoying more demand than I think we deserve. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but we also have a circumstance where supply will be um, constrained because these are capital intensive businesses with long lead times. If we had had this discussion a year ago, there would be a, a few obvious no-brainers. Uh, one in particular would have been oil and gas. Uh, right, it was traded. unpopular because <laughs> Greta didn't like it and uh, you know all of these things. And it, it traded truth, below zero for famously yeah. for that millisecond, yeah. The world runs on it, you know? And so the idea that the industry fully loaded could make oil for $60 a barrel and sell it for $30 a barrel, losing $30 a barrel 90 million times a day means the industry was losing the sunny side of $3 billion a day, which was kind of boring. Uh, either the price had to go up to the point where the industry earned its total cost of capital or cars would stop running. Uh, at $60, the price of oil doesn't have to go up anymore. Although I will say that on a uh, net asset value basis, defining net asset value as future net cash flows at current commodity prices, uh, the oil industry remains extremely attractive relative to its enterprise value, precisely because it's politically incorrect. Okay, so um, that's great. That's great context. So, uh, you know, one thing I want to say sort of about supply is, um, you know, you mentioned um, sort of from the resources side, and this is something that, that you know, I've talked about for years is uh, the concentration of the deposits we're going after are, are in general, or, you know, the new ones that we're finding are, are, are smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And that's just sort of what happens when, you know, you, you, you always go for the good, easy, you know, rich stuff first. And after that's gone, you know, you, you go after what's left, right? So we, we have this sort of um, macro outlook of just going after smaller and smaller concentrations of stuff. And of course that takes, it's harder to find, it takes more energy to get out of the ground. It's more costly to extract all that stuff. Uh, and then secondly, um, you know, certainly looking at America and developed countries, um, there are, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure needs there for, for rebuilding, right? Much of America's infrastructure was built, you know, back in the, uh, you know, Roosevelt era in the 50s um, uh, under the public works projects and whatnot. And, you know, there's a ton of roads and bridges and, and other critical infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the developing world that is competing for those resources to, to continue to build out their nations as well, the Chinas and, and uh, you know, what of the world. 
Um, uh, and then, uh, and then on top of that, Steen Jacobson um, from Saxo Bank, uh, had, we had him on the program the other week, and, and part of his thesis going forward is the digital economy has become so successful, it's grown so so quickly and so become so large, it's actually now constrained by the physical world. Um, the, there's not enough. Uh, trucking fleets, uh, you know, ships, et cetera, to move the, the uh, amount of volume that the digital economy wants to move. Um, so anyways, all those three things to me really line up as ways to say demand for commodities is going to be robust as long as each of those three things remain true. Um, do, do you see that or, or do you see, you, know, you, you said you're a little bit cautious here um, uh, in this is a boom and bust type of environment. Uh, I guess my question is, is g- given all that that I've listed and that, that whatever you see, um, what sort of inning are we in on this commodity cycle? Do you, are we in the early inning still or is it getting late in the tooth? I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. Um, when I look at the topics that you've raised, I would say with regards to the digital economy that that's a fairly ethnocentric remark. Uh, I see uh, that remark being aimed at the United States, Canada, Western Europe, that is to say, the world's historic mouth. The growth for commodities, I suspect, will be at the bottom of the demographic pyramid, the two billion poorest people on earth who are becoming less poor fairly rapidly, a billion people with no access to electricity. They want it, they're gonna get it, uh, and that's gonna matter a lot. With regards to our own infrastructure uh, and the build up for our infrastructure, and by the way, I agree uh, about the need for that infrastructure, particularly a power grid. the power grid alone, uh, making the power grid in the United States addressable, would take about $8 trillion, given the fact that at the federal level, we owe each other $150 trillion before state and local deficits, uh, and given that we have become, uh, well, the most popular government expenditure is stimulus checks, which is to say consumption, rather than investing in the grid. I wonder yeah. if, despite the fact that we need a grid, uh, if we're going to get one anytime soon, if you understand the difficulty uh, I'm having with that. Uh, I think the surprise driver for commodities will not be the increased demand narrative, but rather will be decreasing supply as a consequence of insufficient and inefficient, different words, uh, investment in sustaining capital in natural resources going back as much as three decades. Uh, I, I think that'll be the real shock. Okay. The and, and sorry to interrupt, that, but, do, but do you mean that there's sort of a piper to be paid now where we have just underinvested in the past several decades? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And these are capital intensive cyclical businesses. As an example, there's a wonderful copper deposit in Southern Arizona called Resolution. It was discovered 20 years ago. Uh, it is over a billion tons of one and a half percent copper, high quality copper owned by two of the biggest copper companies in the world. It will probably be tied up in permitting in the United States for another 10 years uh, while it is being financed, while it's being built. If we had a copper shortage four years from now, there's a bunch of copper mines around the world that can't address the shortage because they aren't far enough in the pipeline. So almost irrespective of what we do with regards to certain commodities, the price will have to go up, not because demand goes up, but rather because supply will be constrained. Uh, The same circumstance exists certainly in uh, oil and gas, uh, certainly in uranium. Uh, There's a lot of commodities that almost irrespective of demand growth, if demand held steady, uh, there would be supply shortages. Uh, And supply shortages that are um, in the five-year time frame, impossible to address. Okay, uh, you know, I, I so want to continue talking about macro with you, but I'm looking at the the time, and I think we're on like the second question on my list here. And I know the viewers want us to get a little bit more specific, so let's use that as a jumping off point into this question, which is, you know, you follow many natural resource commodities. Which ones are you most excited about right now? Depends on for who. Um, I think investors who don't own Physical precious metals for insurance purposes are foolish. Uh, I think you have to have liquidity and you need to have a medium of exchange that's simultaneously a store of value, which is a fancy way of saying people need to own physical gold, physical silver, or acceptable surrogates. I believe that because 
precious metals prices are likely to increase, that uh, precious metals mining stocks, protect, particularly the mid caps, offer fairly compelling values, particularly because they're out of favor right now. Uh, I, I believe that the decline that we've seen in precious metals prices, precious metals equities prices, are a, a cyclical decline in a secular bull market and represent great near-term opportunities. Uh, I also believe that the oil and gas business for more conservative investors offers a, a good opportunity, particularly a yield opportunity in a yield starved world. Uh, there are a lot of oil and gas companies that are generating 25% free cash yields. When I say free cash yields, that's net of sustaining capital investments, the investments that are necessary to maintain production at current levels. Uh, this free cash some of it at least, will be distributed back to owners, either in the form of share repurchases or dividends. And in a yield-starved world, uh, those are very attractive yields. I'm attracted, too, to the uranium business, uh, although I have to say uh, I'm not alone in that. The junior uranium stocks have tripled this year, uh, and I no longer think they, uh, I no longer think that the juniors are compelling value. But I note that the global industry average cost, total cost of producing a pound of uranium is between 50 and 60 bucks a pound. Uh, whereas we sell the stuff for 30 bucks a pound. Uh, it's interesting to note then that the industry is losing between 20 and $30 a pound, 65 million times a year. Uh, so the price has to go up. Uh, it has to go up in particular because even countries like the United States, which believe they're rich enough not to need nuclear power, uh, have nuclear power supplying 15% of total energy and 20% of baseload energy. So the equation is pretty simple. Either the price goes up or the lights go out. Uh, I'll leave it to your listeners to decide, irrespective of Ms. Thornburg uh, or Mr. Biden, uh, which of those two alternatives takes place. So. I'm attracted to that. I'm, I'm attracted to, uh, and this is a much longer term play, it probably bore the hell out of your listeners, uh, but I've made an awful lot of money in the last four decades being a, a water and water rights investor. Uh, and I think we've come to the, area, to the area in the United States where the artificial pricing of water politically runs right straight into the physical constraints of supplying water for the US West and Southwest. Uh, and I think that the resolution uh, of that irony will be very interesting to look at. So for investors that have a sense of humor for esoteric long-term investments, uh, certainly water would be one of those. All right. Um, well, thank you. That was a great list. Um, let's, let's start actually at the water. Um, what, are, what are ways that people can actually invest in, uh, in water? You know, you can go out and buy purchase water rights, which I know yeah. from knowing people who do, it's very arcane, it's highly specialized, yeah. a lot of competition. Uh, uh, I did a lot of that. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to say now, it's a bad pun, but water has become a liquid uh, as an investment class. <laughs> that and, is a terrible <laughs> pun. <laughs> you have to invest in it uh, if you're going to do it easily by investing in some of the agricultural companies that have water rights appurtenant to their land rights. Uh, examples would be the closely held California farming giant, J.G. Boswell, uh, which may be the largest private water rights holder in the state of California. Uh, another might be Limonera, which is another California-based farmer that grows citruses and avocados, and also, by the way, controls 2,200 developable acres uh, in Ventura County, California at Santa Paula. But those would be two names that investors could look at in terms of uh, enjoying at least uh, uh, indirectly large uh, and undervalued water holdings. All right, and, and we'll get to this in a moment, but you said at least J.G. Boswell is a, is a large private company. How, how does one, it, it, It's not private, they never went public, but it's a 130, 140 year old company. So it, it went public in a Malthusian sense. Uh, owner bequeaths to owner who bequeaths to owner, which is to say you're in the fifth generation of shareholders now. And they went over the 500 shareholder mark because of biology rather than because of a public offering. <laughs> it, it trades over the counter. Um, you do almost need to make an appointment to make a trade. Uh, and that keeps it very, very cheap for those of us who care enough uh, to hang around and be bored owning it. Okay. So let me put some words in your mouth and then you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. 
Um, so it sounds like with companies like those, you know, you're saying, look, the, the water is mispriced right now. There are these sort of govern, government mandates that, that, that have attached a political pricing structure to it that really you see there's a big arbitrage between that and what reality is. Yep. The world hasn't woken up to that yet. So buy some of these companies that own the water rights like, you know, the, the ones you mentioned and, and someday expect the world to wake up to this and there's going to be a repricing moment. Is that accurate? Accurate. Yeah. I mean, your risk is that uh, when the repricing moment occurs, uh, the surplus wealth may be stolen by the government. Water is regarded as a right. Uh, and so it could be very, it could very well be the case that the state of California would steal Boswell's water, uh, in which case you wouldn't benefit. That's certainly a risk that you run. Water pricing in California is insane. Uh, it's truly insane. We subsidize such brilliant activities as growing rice in the desert. 86% uh, of the water that's consumed in California goes to contribute 2.5% to state GDP. Um, water metaphorically flows uphill to votes rather than downhill to utility or money. This circumstance will resolve itself. I'm just not sure how. How, oh, yeah. And, and of course, you know, we're talking about California. I think the entire American West is... Um, Right. you know, facing similar issues that California is right now with water. We're still in a big drought. I, I live in Northern California. We just found out last week that this, the snowpack, which is the main source of water for the Central Valley, which is where all the food is grown, is gone. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if this is the on record, the earliest year it's ever been gone, but it's certainly one of them. So all of these issues, if uh, the climate doesn't change anytime uh, soon to become more favorable, this water rights mispricing is going to get only you know, more extreme. And to your point, the more extreme it gets, maybe the higher the risk the government actually comes in and, and just uh, declares eminent domain and takes them. But, but very interesting. So let me put some more words in your mouth here with uranium. Um, it sounds to me like you're looking at the uranium industry in general today, sort of the way that you were looking at the oil and gas industry or the oil industry last year. Is that right. accurate? That's correct. Yeah. I mean, oil and gas is a bigger business and frankly, a better business. Uh, again, pardon the pun, uh, I was around for the last uranium bull market and it was nothing if not explosive. When the <laughs> price of uranium goes up, the impact on the free cash flows of uranium producers goes absolutely crazy. Uh, absolutely crazy. I remember in the last uranium bull market, which was 1999 to 2006, at the beginning of that bull market, there were five uranium juniors that had survived a 20 year bear market. In the next six years, the poorest performer of those five juniors was up 22 fold, not 22%, but rather 22 fold. Well, geez, when, Rick, that, that almost sounds like a <laughs> cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a, a cryptocurrency that normal people that are just have facility with arithmetic <laughs> can understand. When the price of uranium goes from a certain price to a price that it has to go to in order for the light switch to work. Uh, you, you know, it's, I'm not trying to say that there isn't value inherent in the cryptocurrencies, but one needs to understand the value of networks and all those types of things. Yeah, with, and I don't want to with, pick a fight with those guys. And yeah, I don't some, either. I don't I'll have some crypto experts on later. So let's stay in the yeah. real world with you. So, so, so kind of building on that, um, so the precious metals mining stocks up until quite recently, have been just, they've been widow makers. They've been dumpster fires for capital for a long time. Um, and uh, the industry, I'm gonna put words in your mouth again. Um, it looks like the industry has sort of been forced to clean up its balance sheets, its management teams, et cetera, over the past decade of pain. And uh, the precious metal prices have now recovered from their long slumber and uh, you know are now, um, I think you said, you know, that you thought the outlook for, for the precious metals, the, the commodities themselves are good. Um, are we, are, are we uh, potentially looking at an era sort of like you were talking about with the last uranium bull market, where if precious metals um, really do have their moment in the sun, we may see some of these producers have some of those, you know, 5, 10, 15 X gains of the kind that you, you mentioned the uranium market had? Yeah, you know, I think in the juniors, which, by the way, I think are uniformly overpriced, uh, they have already enjoyed two or 300 percent runs. It's interesting that uh, uh, a sector that arguably doesn't have any gold 
has responded very well to the move in the gold price. <laughs> I guess that has to do with the fact that we live in a narrative time. I think looking at the gold equities or the precious metals equities, rather, you need to segregate into at least three buckets. The best of the best, the royalty companies, the big producers, the mid cap producers and the juniors. Uh, if you merged every junior mining company in the world into one company, Junior Explorco, uh, that company would lose in a very good year $2 billion and in a bad year $10 billion. So what I'm trying to say is that the juniors as a whole are valueless, irrespective of the gold price. That obscures the fact that 5% of those juniors generate so much performance, 10 baggers, 20 baggers, that they add legitimacy and sometimes luster to the sector. The mid-cap gold producers here are selling at the most attractive relationship between enterprise value and net asset value of my career. At the current gold price, at the current strip, without having to make gold price assumptions looking forward. And the big gold producers, the best of the best, uh, are uh, in the context of $1,800 gold, fairly priced. My belief for most of your listeners who don't want to do a lot of work and take a lot of risk is that they concentrate on the best of the best. Uh, they de-risk their stock selection and perhaps be uh, willing to even underperform the index a little bit by de-risking it. You, you go where I'm, know where I'm going with this. You could, as an example, buy an ETF, which would give you 40 or 50 names. The problem with that is that 25 names are ones that if you looked at them carefully, you wouldn't want to own. So I'm beginning to think that for most investors, building a portfolio of the five or six or seven best gold producers in the world, even at the risk of marginally underperforming the index, but having no individual company risk is probably a better way to go. In my experience, the market beta that you get in a precious metals bull market is so extraordinary that for most people, trying to outperform the index is a waste of time. We hope you've been enjoying this conversation with natural resources investor Rick Rule. The interview continues over in part two, where Rick generously shares the names of the top five mining companies that he believes offer the highest appreciation potential for the lowest risk. To watch part two, just click on the link provided in the description of this video below, or simply go to youtube.com slash Wealthion. But before you go, please don't forget to click the subscribe button below this video if you haven't done so yet already. Oh, and if you'd appreciate a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial professional who takes into consideration that both the macro risks and the market opportunities that Rick has talked about here, just go to Wealthion.com and we'll set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you over at part two of our interview with Rick Rule.